a bit of news regarding radicalization. They have arrested individuals. How do you convince them that your interpretation is more correct or you have not been indoctrinated by the system? <laughs> very, very interesting question. So recently in Singapore, there's been quite a bit of news regarding radicalization. There's been the youngest guy that got issued a restriction notice by yeah. the ISD, yeah. as well as even in our neighboring country, Johor, there was just an attack on the police station. And so we thought that radicalization as a topic is something that is very important, but we don't really know much about. And so mm. today we have invited Dr. Muhammad bin Ali here to Doctor. join with us. His name is very cool. <laughs> Welcome, Dr. <laughs> Dr. Muhammad Welcome, Ali. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. You know when I first opened the door, right, he's like, hi, I'm Muhammad Ali. And I was like, oh, yeah, you are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so Dr. Muhammad is one of the foremost authorities on interreligious relations in mm. Singapore. And in fact, he's the co-chairman of the Religious Rehabilitation Group. So he's been counseling radicalized individuals for over 20 wow. years now. Also a very brave man yeah. Yeah. for coming to talk about this. I, I think this is a very, very sensitive topic. We mm. need to uh, tread a bit. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I think maybe we can start with you sharing with us a bit about what the RRG does. Okay. The Religious Rehabilitation Group, we call it RRG in short, has been around for um, slightly more than two decades. The formation of RRG was a reaction to the discovery of the Jama Islamia way back in 2001, where JI, they planned to uh, bombed several targets in Singapore, the US embassy, the Australian embassy, some critical infrastructures in Singapore. Yeah. You know, like the water pipeline that links Singapore and Malaysia. Mm. Right. So, Is it the, the Changi Airport Tower as well? Yeah. One of the GI leaders planned to hijack a plane from Bangkok to crash it on Changi Airport. Right. Right. But something that we need to understand here that terrorism or acts of violence is not something new in Singapore. We have, you know, faced you know, threats eh? mm. from racial riots, confrontation. But the threat posed by GIs was something very different back then because of the religious element. Yeah. So when the ISD arrested these individuals, they did not believe that they were doing something wrong. That's mm. our jihad. Right. Right. I'm not sure whether you have heard about the word jihad, mm. right? The authorities realized that such a threat, you know, uh, you know, need a kind of strategic response, consult mm. uh, the the religious leaders, the religious communities. Yeah. And this has led to the formation of the RRG in 2003. I can still remember, you know, back then, the Prime Minister Go Chok Tong, right after the arrest, he called, uh, he invited uh, around 200 religious leaders and community leaders mm. at the Kalang Do Stadium wow. to brief about this development. But one important thing that then PM Go Chokton mentioned is that this arrest has nothing to do with Islam. Mm. It's nothing to do with the Muslims. Mm. It is a problem of national security. So I think mm. these are good points to make the important distinction that what we are talking about today is not just specific to Muslims or Islam. I think because Dr. Muhammad here, the majority of our experience is with rehabilitating Muslim radicals. And so a lot of the examples that we are going to be using today will relate to that. But okay. Of course, this happens across religions, course, across races. Yeah. And I think maybe we can start by making the clear distinction of what Muslims actually believe and what are radical ideas that are developing. So one example was what you mentioned just now was jihad. Could you maybe lead us and clarify uh, what that term actually means? It basically means uh, uh, to strive or to put effort in, and into doing something good, mm -hmm. right? But one of the meanings of jihad in Islamic tradition, especially in Islamic legal tradition, is to be involved in a legitimate battlefield that is prescribed by Islamic law. If you look at the history of the Prophet and Islam, there were battles in the past. Even this happened in, in Christianity, in Hinduism. Mm. The Crusades. Crusades, mm. yeah. right? The GI members, they legitimized their actions of violence by claiming that it is an act of jihad. Yeah. You know, this is a strategy, mm -hmm. a strategy to mobilize individuals, to indoctrinate others, right? So, so this is where I think uh, uh, for many years, we have been trying to, to correct, uh, you know, these misunderstandings of the religion. Do you think that you can share with us the line that was from perhaps the, the Quran where it's often used to weaponize 
to weaponize uh, to weaponize the mind. Yeah. 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 Many of these individuals who belong to Islamist or violent Islamist organizations, they they quote Quranic verses uh, that uh, was that would reveal uh, on the jihad that happened during the time of the Prophet. Yeah. Right. And the context was different. Right. Their enemies uh, were, you know, were the pagans, mm. uh, uh, were the non-Muslims, those who do not follow him, right? That jihad or that battlefield was permissible because there was no other way out. It was the last resort. Right. When God, for example, said that you you you, you kill the disbelievers in the Quran, that disbelievers refers to a specific group that uh. happened during the time of the Prophet, They were the enemies of the Prophet who fought Muhammad and his companions. Right, right, right. So that verses of the Quran cannot be used in today's context to describe general non-Muslims. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Okay. And fighting in the in the legitimate battlefield mm. is very different from bombing. You know, mm. <laughs> from right. suicide attacks. Right. 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 So how can they claim they are doing jihad mm -hmm. uh, and they are doing? Uh, Uh, killing and and uh, suicide attacks and, and and things like that. But I'm curious, right? Like, I mean, obviously we don't hear about this radicalization news every day. But under the surface, how many Singaporeans are actually, you know, getting yeah? Is there an estimated number? Getting... ISD over the years, they have uh, arrested individuals under ISA for terrorism-related activities. Huh? Internal Security Act. Internal Security Act. They have arrested individuals from the GI group. Self radicalization, I think over 100 individuals. No oh, shit. But do you think that only this few arrestees they were the only one radicalized in Singapore? Yeah. I don't think so. Mm. Yeah. Do you think that if you are talking to someone, interacting with someone, you'll be able to tell whether they are like there's some early alarm bells? No, it's very difficult because it has to do with people's uh, inclination and passion about religion as well. Yeah, it's very sensitive. What would you say are the telltale signs? Because, for example, right in this case specifically, because it's recent, so that's why we keep talking about it. Also, right. Yeah. So on one hand, he say he want to go and uh, work part time to fund his travel to Afghanistan, and in that case, then as a parent, I'm like, wow, my my son want to go and work part time, you know, want to earn yeah. his own pocket money. It was so good. Then I should support yeah. him. Right? It looks positive. Humanitarian effort. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And also something else that they the parents actually realized, but then they didn't think that it was cause for intervention. Was that he stopped celebrating like females, uh, classmates' birthdays and all this kind of thing. So then it could just be, uh, maybe he's just not friends with them. Yeah. But at what point yeah. is, does this become a telltale sign of radicalization? Okay. I think some of the key ones are, for example, when 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 a person, when when parents, for example, when they, they notice or they discover their children or loved ones uh, frequently uh, browsing extremist websites. Right. Yeah. Or even a step before that, frequenting, uh, you know, uh, web uh, Islamic websites. No, although they're not not violent, but but they may be kind of right. Suspicious sudden, there. sudden curiosity. Curiosity. Yeah. But it could be. Oh my God! My son loves God so much. You know? Yeah. Yeah. That's why we have to monitor first. It's a uh, common like issue. Your brain, You know. Yeah. 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 Sorry, sorry, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. And you have to give time. Yeah. yeah. You have to give yeah, time. Yeah. 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 Self radicalization today has a lot to do with what you say. The internet, hmm. social media platforms—they have become part of our life, and we cannot stop that from young people. At the same time, extremist organizations and individuals—they are very smart because they have used and manipulated these platforms for the purpose of justification and recruitment. Mm. Mm. If you ask me today. Is ISIS still alive? Eh? ISIS, in reality today, ISIS has lost its territories. They have lost their military capabilities. But one thing they have been very successful. They were able to disseminate, to propagate their ideas and propaganda through the internet. And they have managed to influence young-minded individuals from across the globe. Yeah. When you talk mm. about, um, say for example, ISIS disseminating their messages, what does that look like? Because I can't imagine it's like an Instagram post with like a caption. Yeah. Yes, good question. They produce in online magazines. For example, ISIS produced magazine. If a, a young Muslim, maybe with no knowledge or very little knowledge of Islam. Yeah. Impressionable. 
yeah he can be easily swayed into what has been written there right because the magazine is a magazine of islam that contains a lot of quranic verses and prophetic tradition is it difficult to get hold of this magazine if i google search can i find it easily yes you can oh I damn know. groups like isis al qaeda or boko haram or jai or all these groups they need to use religion because of two purposes number one for the purpose of legitimacy and justification mm. so yeah. when when they justify their actions through uh, by using religion don't you think people mm. will get attracted yeah. also you can't argue with that can't argue number two they need religion to mobilize and recruit people mm. right yeah. if you take out the element or this element of religion from icing from isis do you think they can survive difficult i don't think mm. they can survive no reason to read their magazine also magazine is free lah right presumably <laughs> it's free lah right yeah where where the budget no hey budget. i see have a sick comms team if you think about it you know what i mean that's true and this is not new in, in the past you know al qaeda has also used online magazines actually it's been from the from the test of time like publication press yeah. media since yeah. the very beginning like even in the the 20s or the 30s propaganda yeah. has always been like yeah they have their own like media this. production you know yeah. media team Do you imagine you meet someone from ICS? Then what you do? Oh, social media team. So an ICS of you. So yeah. that means when they produce the really low quality like videos, actually it's purposely on. Yeah, yeah. It's, they grow packing. They shooting us for it. If you watching Mr. V's video, for example, like if you, 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 let let's imagine this 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 studio, right? I believe that ICS has a, a, a room like this studio, which is ten times bigger yeah. and more sophisticated. Yeah. 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 Not hard to fight like our studios, so. because they know that this is their battle. Mm. Yeah, they can only win this ideological battle, not physical battle. And that is where my argument, my own personal view about this is: until today, we have not yet managed to get the true remedy for self radicalization. Yeah, in your experience, was it possible to rehabilitate those that are indoctrinated? Because to a certain extent, they would feel like you represent the bastardization of the religion, and they represent the true faith. How do you convince them that your interpretation is more correct, or you have not been indoctrinated by the system? All right, <laughs> very very interesting question. You know, like uh, your religion or many other religious tradition. There is this notion of interpretation of scriptures, yeah, mm. yeah. whether it's the Quran, the Bhagavad Gita, the Bible, and others. We don't have the so-called power or ability to stop anyone from believing in anything, believing or holding to one or particular interpretation. Yeah. yeah. But what we are very concerned is there's only one thing: the legitimizing of violence. If you look at all the different interpretations, none of the the Muslim scholars who interpreted the Quran, eh, they justified that the verses of jihad in the Quran legitimize violence in today's context, killing the non-Muslims and killing the Muslims who do not adhere to the kind of Islam uh, as subscribed by the by the terrorists. Right. right. So it's the fact that their interpretation contradicts the rest of the Quran, yeah. Lah, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Yeah, I, I think can. I think like, you can believe in this uh, school of thought or that school of thought, right? Yeah. But when it comes to violence and when it comes to national security, we we do not compromise that. Yeah, yeah. Basically, we don't care what interpretation you have <laughs> as long as <laughs> yeah. Fair enough. We have yeah. to commit now. Yeah. You and me. That we have to reject violence. Yeah, yeah. And I think like the big difference with the more recent case also, right? It's not just that. So essentially, the boy was trying to influence some of his schoolmates, right? And then preparing to go and fight for the black flag army overseas. Exactly. Yeah. But then exactly. one yeah. step further is that he felt that if he couldn't go on this trip. If he couldn't maybe like find the funds for it or whatever, he is willing to under the direction of the BFA carry out attacks in Singapore on Singaporeans. Yeah. Wow. And that was, I think, when they really took it seriously. They cross. He crossed the line, yeah. Essentially. Yeah, cross the line. Yeah. yeah. But concepts like jihad and and other doctrines, these are not the only things we discuss in our counseling session. Right. Mm. Yeah. yeah. We also need to identify whether he or she has other issues. Especially those related to the Singapore context. Right. When we 
spoke to the GI detainees, for example, you know, some of them, they have issues living in Singapore. Oh. Why? Because Singapore is a non-Islamic system of governance. Mm. Singapore is not an Islamic country. Right. They possess a sense of hostility towards the so-called religious other. Right. right. And something that they forget or they misunderstood is it's also against Islam for us to hate the non-Muslims. And there's uh, there, there there is one one verse in the Quran which I can remember, in Arabic it says "Walakat karamna bani Adam," which means and we have honored the sons of Adam. Ooh, Adam and Eve is in the Quran. Yes. A lot of Moses. Yeah, I'm not of the prophets. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, my, 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 you know. <laughs> yeah. We, just, we kind of collectively feel like. Yeah. Mm, you know, Abraham we, is also in that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, so Singaporean Muslims, we are very unique because we live in three unique situation. Number one, we are Muslim minority. Number two, we live in a plural society, and number three, we live in a secular government. And let me say something which I think is important: that Islam has no problems with Muslims living in all these three conditions. Right. right. That, that was my next question. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. this is something that they do not appreciate. Or maybe they don't have the artist understanding. This is where we come in. Right. right. So we need to also, it's not always about countering violence and jihad. Okay. So when you counsel these individuals, right, are these also things that you go through with them? And then how do they then come to that realization, right, that, oh, this is a twisting of the word? All right. When we meet our client, uh, those whom we, we want to counsel, you know, the, the very first important step is for us not to talk about any religious issues. Mm. The most important thing is to build the rapport and relationship. Mm. And then the next step is for us to gradually identify the issues that need to be dealt with. Because it varies from individual to another. Some individuals, they might have understanding about jihad. Some have misunderstanding or confusion about Islamic law in Singapore. Mm. Some has issues with hijab. So we have to identify these things first. Yeah. And this, this will take a couple of uh, months. How do you then know that they're legitimately de-radicalized? Because like you say, it takes several months, right? Yeah. How do you know they're not just saying what you want to hear at yeah. the end of the process? Basically, you're asking how can we know one that one is rehabilitated? Or yeah. Right? Yeah. It's a very common question. If you ask me, there is no way we can 100% know that he or she is rehabilitated. Mm -hmm. right. But there's a part here. After engaging the person for many months or many years, as a person who has been with him for quite some time, we, we can observe the improvement. We can observe the change in his thinking. Right. At this point, is this person in jail? It depends because there are two types of detention. I mean, one is... Uh, uh, those who are given restriction orders mm. and the, the other is those given order of detention. So right. just some context, like with the most recent case, they were given restriction orders oh, that's, and that's, that essentially means that you are not allowed to change your residence or employment or travel out of Singapore without the approval of the director of ISD. That's right. okay. Yeah. And also you are not allowed to use the internet or social media or issue any public statements or address, the, or address public meetings without approval. But if I suspect that somebody is maybe developing some dangerous ideas, right? Then what should I do? Of course, should I mean, I, for, for that case, it's clear cut. It's the, 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 the signs are very clear. No, but I suspect only. Like, for example, I realized that my friends start talking about some crazy ideas, right? Then maybe keep retweeting maybe like white supremacy kind of tweets and all that. All then, right. But yeah. then they can play it off as a joke, ma. Sure. Like, oh, I just thought it was funny, so I just retweet. The off. first thing, is it continuous? Is it something that that he or she repeats? Maybe they recently started retweeting some. Yeah, sometimes they might doing a research project or what? Uh -oh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to be a social experiment. Very yeah. much. <laughs> so it's really it's not easy to say okay yes or no. You have to yeah. do this. No, yeah, you have yeah. to keep monitoring, okay. keep engaging, and from the from the from by monitoring and through the engagement commission, you will know that he's genuine or not. Quite a lot of it involves either speaking to my kid a lot. So then I get a sense of like, who are they glorifying or, or what are they supporting? Yeah. But the other, like seeing who they're contacting or seeing what their like websites they're visiting, that one's a little bit more subtle because I need to be like tracking their internet browsing history. Yeah. Yeah. So like, do you recommend if I suspect my child being radicalized, it's just about having more conversations with them? 
Like what's a healthy yeah. way to go about it? I think uh, most importantly is number one, this is where, this is something that maybe we can observe in our own community. There is a lack of uh, communication, interaction between parents and children. Right. Especially when both parents are working. You know, when I step into my house, that is my second work, you know. So you are such a brave man for saying that. Yeah. <laughs> because the second job is our family. Yeah. yeah. I mean, usually parents, they will leave it, their children with the computers, yeah? yeah. And do not, they don't care. Because obviously children will say, oh, I'm doing my school work. My school yeah. work, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right, yeah. For but, five hours. Right? Yeah, yeah, for five hours. I also cannot study for five hours, no? <laughs> I'm like, a doctor already. <laughs> <laughs> right. The rest of us got no yeah. So start by asking, okay, are you done with your school work? Yeah. Yes. Then why are you still on the computer? Mm, yeah. Right? By asking this question, the children become, you know, you know, they are aware that their parents want to know what they are doing, right. even online. It's no longer the time in the past when I was young, our parents are worried, where do we go, you know? Yeah. <laughs> now they want you to go out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and now yeah. when, I would, when the children are inside the house, eh, sitting on the computer for yeah. hours, this is where they were scared. Yeah. It does yeah. feel like mischief happens at home now. <laughs> right. <your> outside. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Sometimes exactly. I don't care what you do, you must come back by this time. Yeah. Then you'll be okay. <laughs> well, yeah. Times have changed already. Because 99%, I would say nearly 100% of all the self-radicalization cases in our country hmm. happen online. Right. Yeah. Wow. So what happens if, let's say, I do suspect a colleague, right? That is surfing those websites and whatnot. And early signs, we're not that close. Yeah. So it's not my position to go and sit there and question his yeah. religious beliefs. So I report him using the hotline. What, what then happens to him? It's better to be safe than sorry, you know. Agree. I think it's extremely important for us to report. But reporting does not necessarily lead to detention yeah. or even the issuance of an ISA. Right. Like if the authorities make the assessment after investigation that he is okay, then he will not be. Ah, uh, yeah. yeah. okay. And so they investigate yeah, first. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, but that is reporting to, to the ISD, the government. But help can also uh, uh, be consulted from yeah. RRG. Right. Okay. So because, you have a hotline as well? Yes, uh, okay. because we, we have a, a counseling center where we can also talk to individuals who, who, who have even confusion. Yeah. yeah, I guess the advice is that if, if you do come across a friend that is showing signs of this and they are willing to do something very, very drastic about it, then as a friend, perhaps it's possible to advise them to call the hotline to at least challenge the beliefs before you go to jail and die for it. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, to at least see whether someone else can change your mind or to challenge the belief that you have like, and see what the other side is. Yeah. Have there been instances where, so someone has reported to, or like uh, called the hotline, RRG, and you deemed a case as you are talking to the, the client that you really need to report them to ISD. Right? Yes, but but it doesn't lead to the the issuance of ISA to the person. Of course. Right. Yeah. Of course. But it shows that, you know, getting help and early intervention mm. helps a lot. Mm. Yeah. It helps the family, it helps the ch the, 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 the child. Yeah. yeah. Prevention yeah. really is yeah. better than giving. I was also thinking about it with the recent case. He actually like tried to ask his schoolmates to join him, right? And yeah. maybe if the schoolmates had the awareness to go and alert the authorities, mm. then they could have nipped it in the bud also. Yeah. 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 I think first and foremost, we need to understand that no one is born a terrorist. Yeah. No one is born with the radical ideas in Bible in his mind. Yeah. It is only when someone, you know, uh, reach a certain stage of his life where he was indoctrinated. Yeah. He was exposed to these ideas. So because he was not born with these ideas, it was programmed into his mind. Yeah. We believe that it can be deprogrammed. Yeah. Right. right. We can be it can be deprogrammed. But this is not something natural. The mm. human beings have. And that's it for today. Of course, a big thank you to Dr. Muhammad for joining us today. Thank you so much for coming. Helping us thank break you this so much. down. We hope that you've gotten a better understanding of radicalization in Singapore and how it can happen. And we will put resources and links down in the description below. So mm. if you suspect anything, maybe you can hit there and there are help links. Yeah. yeah. How do you like serious episodes, guys? <laughs> very, very <laughs> like, serious. Yeah. So don't forget to like, share, subscribe, and we'll see you in the next episode. Bye bye. So I heard this story, right? Um, from Ryan. Last time NOC did a campaign for. 
and she's secure. Okay. They approve this entire concept of what happens in the, the event of a terrorist attack and blah, blah, blah. How, how, you, how you can use the app, right? Some dress as terrorists and some dress as office worker. Then they got a plastic rifle, <laughs> then got the orange tip. You all know that? <laughs> I think I have that toy gun. Yeah, okay. And then, right, they called the SG security team to say that we need to film the report itself. Yeah. Then the SG security oh. team says, okay. Yeah. So they type random gun, blah, blah, blah. Then they take picture of Zizie in the, in the yeah. thing, right? Five, 10 minutes later, right? Like the, the Singapore equivalent of SWAT waiting for them <laughs> downstairs. Then they, they they pointed the rifle at Zizie because Zizie looks heavily armed. Right? So he almost shot himself and then they just want to cry. But then like clearly everyone holding like Go tripod. Right? Then he's like put, like, put down their, their weapon or something. And then everybody panic. So that was how one of the first major ads of, S, of SG Secure went about. Oh my god. Yeah. Which it works. Yeah. The point. Like at the end of the day, they reflected. Then they're like, wow. The app actually you, worked. You didn't think that something submitted by an app would summon yeah, 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 our, yeah. our SWAT team <laughs> like that. So uh, very impressed. Good job. SG truly secure. Yeah, yeah, yeah.